Despite being a mere one fortieth of our body weight, the brain uses around a fifth of our glucose energy and oxygen and blood circulation. This little three pound lump of neurons and support cells is a pretty big deal because without it, you wouldn't be able to see or hear or feel or taste or smell anything at all, even if your peripheral nervous system and all your sensory receptors were totally intact. Without it, you wouldn't be able to experience emotions or recall memories or solve problems or communicate with anyone at all. Indeed, without it, you wouldn't have any thoughts at all. Fundamentally, the you that makes you you wouldn't exist, even if the rest of your body were somehow kept alive with fancy medical equipment. So the brain's pretty important. Now, we won't get very deep into neuroanatomy here. Rather, for now, I just want to hit on a few of the really important parts so that we have some common terminology to use when we talk about various sensory and perceptual systems. If we need to get more detailed, we'll do it in later videos when it's relevant. For now, the basics that would help to know. Uh, first, there's some stuff near the bottom. The brainstem and the cerebellum, specifically, are worth mentioning. These are really important for some basic life functions like breathing, sleep, basic movement coordination, and so on. So the cerebellum is kind of the little butt down here at the back of the brain, and the brainstem is going up. It's kind of, it connects down to the spinal cord down here where the rest of your body is. Okay, then a little further up towards the middle in this picture we've got, and, and literally toward the middle of the brain, as in deep inside your skull, is the limbic system. The limbic system is important for a lot of stuff relating to like emotions, but also drives and motivation and rewards, learning from reinforcement and punishment and stuff like that. Specifically, three structures are worth mentioning right now. The amygdala, you may have heard called the emotion center of the brain, and there's some truth to that. It certainly is active during most emotional situations or tasks, but it's probably most strongly associated with uh, like fear and rage and the learning that goes with those, like learning what to fear and what not. Think of like a mama rat protecting her pups, things like that. Then there's the hypothalamus, which controls hormones. Like if the pituitary gland is the master gland of the hormonal endocrine system, the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland's boss in the nervous system. It also does a lot of work to keep us in homeostasis, like keeping our basic functions balanced. And finally, there's the hippocampus, which is an important part of the limbic system. If you've heard of it before, you've no doubt heard it called like the memory center of the brain. And there's a grain of truth to that, but it's, that's way oversimplified. The hippocampus doesn't really store memories. Memories are stored in a distributed manner throughout the brain. We could remove the hippocampus and you would still remember your childhood and your name and what three plus three equals and how to ride a bike and what the word neuron means. But what would happen without the hippocampus is you couldn't form new memories. It's essential for laying down new long-term memories, making them more permanent in the brain, consolidating them. So without it, you end up like the main character in Memento where you can't remember what just happened five minutes ago. Now, a good way to remember hippocampus, just as a mnemonic here, is imagine seeing a hippo wandering through campus. You'd sure as hell form a new memory. A hippo on campus equals a new memory. That's, I don't know, easiest way to remember it. Finally, the part of the brain we're going to be most interested in and spend most of our time discussing in this course is the cerebral cortex. It's kind of the upper and outer layer that you can see here in the picture. It's uh, got all those folds and valleys that you're used to thinking of when you see a brain. It's about 40% of the brain's mass and has something like 15 billion neurons in it. And it has the areas that are most relevant for things we might think of as like higher thought, future planning and stuff like that, but also for processing a lot of our perception, especially when we consciously experience sensory input. And it's, you know, for controlling skilled motor action and things like that. So let's zoom in on the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex, it's made up of four lobes, kind of split into four lobes, which have been helpfully color coded here in the picture. We'll talk about each of these in turn, but just to list them, the four lobes are the occipital lobe in the back, so it's blue here, the temporal lobe on the sides by our ears, then the parietal lobe, it's up top, maybe a little bit back from the middle, and finally the frontal lobe, which you may be surprised to hear, is in the front. Now, importantly, when we refer to these 
four lobes, you've got to understand there's actually a left and a right hemisphere of the brain, a left and a right half. So there's kind of a left and a right copy of each lobe. As I'll show you in a second, there's really a frontal lobe on, on the left side and the right side, an occipital lobe on the left and the right side, and so on. We could refer to the left temporal lobe, and it would mean that cerebral cortex area that's by your left ear, but not the right side copy. So, okay, let's dive into these four areas specifically. The occipital lobe first. Again, this is the one at the back in blue in the picture here. It's dedicated largely to vision, to processing information we get from our eyes. And maybe other places you might see it activate would be like some parts being activated when we mentally imagine a visual image in our mind's eye. Again, we've got the occipital lobe, we've got like a copy on the left side and a copy on the right side, so to speak. So at the back of our head, there's kind of a left half and a right half of the occipital lobe. But I'll just refer to that combined stuff as the occipital lobe for short. It's actually got a bunch of sub areas that are specialized for certain aspects or steps in visual processing, like a color area that if that part of your brain is damaged, you may become colorblind or an area specialized for motion or areas for form and shape and putting that together from the, the input from our eyes or areas of the brain specialized for location, like visual location, where in the visual field is it or other spatial aspects of visual input. And at the very, very back, of this blue part, very, very back of the occipital lobe. It's actually the first major stop in the cortex for info from our eyes, which we would call the primary visual cortex, or we'll see later, it's just called V1 for visual, V and one meaning primary. We'll come back to that when we talk about our sense of vision in detail. Then there's the temporal lobe. Again, this is on the, the side of your head, kind of in red here in the picture, one on the left half, one on the right half. And this is specialized for hearing. So our initial auditory processing happens here. That's where the A1, the primary auditory cortex is. This is also where that info gets shared with nearby brain areas that help us understand language, especially early steps in processing language and, and you know, comprehending the, the words that we're hearing and things like that. Um, it's also the temporal lobe does a lot of recognition and categorizing. So, so putting things into categories or conceptualizing. A way to remember this one, if you're trying to uh, mnemonic to remember all these different parts, the temporal lobe is the one closest to our temples, right? On the side of our head by our ears. So that might help you remember that it's the temporal lobe because it's by the temples. And then of course, there's also by the ears, which will help you remember that it's for hearing, right? That it processes hearing. And to remember where language happens, well, usually for, for most people, the base way of using language is spoken language, which we hear, right? So you can kind of remember all those as being close to each other. And obviously, of course, language requires categorizing things, having concepts for things like a zebra versus a horse being different things. That's sort of, we have different names for them because they're different categories or concepts. So that's a kind of mnemonic to remember those details. Okay. Then up in the kind of yellow in our image here, again, at the top of the head, a little bit towards the back, is the parietal lobe. Again, we have a left version of it, and then there would be a right version of it as well. And this is primarily for processing spatial information. It also is the part of our brain that processes touch, that gets the initial signals, the initial processing, the initial area for touch information, and also tracks like our body position, our posture and, and kinematics and things like that. And finally, it's a, an important place for integrating sensory information, like info from our other senses, including the visual information in our brain. A lot of it will be sent up here to the parietal lobe. And even sound information, a lot of it will be sent to the parietal lobe, especially when putting that information together to make sense of space, right? To give us a sense of where we are in a three-dimensional world around us. And finally, we have the frontal lobe. As I said, it's often implicated or, or part of the widespread networks involved in things we might call higher order functions like judgment, planning, reasoning, and stuff that we might say makes up our personality, like how much self-control you have. It's also important for integrating information over time. So you'll see it gets some connections from all the sensory areas throughout our brain and sends connections back to them. And same with various memory related areas like the hippocampus so that we can think about the past and the future and learn over time. Also, the frontal lobe is responsible for initiating and planning out voluntary movement. It houses a, a little sub area towards the back of it called the motor cortex. When you decide to raise your hand or grab your water bottle or something like that, that movement is initiated in the frontal lobe before getting sent out as an 
efferent signal to elsewhere in your body. Now, on its way out, before it goes down the spinal cord and out to the peripheral nervous system to the muscles, there's also often processing and, and motor coordination of the more unconscious and automatic type um, that will happen in the cerebellum. It actually interacts. It, it helps uh, along with other areas. But the frontal lobe is really where voluntary movement, the kind we're consciously aware of, as opposed to you know just automated coordination of different muscles while you walk, something like that without having to think about it, that would be the cerebellum, but deciding to walk or saying, I'm gonna raise my leg or I'm gonna kick, that would be voluntary movement initiated in the frontal lobe. Okay, here's another version of just that same basic image, bringing those four lobes together. Now with the brain stem and the cerebellum in the picture there that we talked about before, also the limbic system is in there, it's just tucked inside the middle of the brain. It's above the brain stem, but not pictured here. Now this image on the right just paints a little more detail relevant specifically to the sensory systems. As I've said, our sensory info generally ends up in a primary receiving area in the cortex, denoted with a 1 for primary, like A1 or V1 for vision, before getting further processed elsewhere in the cortex. So for audition, A1 is this purple area at the top of the temporal lobe. For vision, it's V1 primary visual cortex at the back of the occipital lobe. At the front of the parietal lobe, this little strip that we see at the front there in, in yellow, that's called the primary somatosensory cortex. So we give it an S1, where again, the root word there is soma, meaning body. So that's for processing body sense information like touch and pain, things like that. Finally, notice the reddish strip right next to it. That's at the back of the frontal lobe and that's called the primary motor cortex, or M1, right? M for motor, one for primary. And that's the part of the frontal lobe I was talking about that starts and plans out voluntary movement. It has like support areas nearby in the frontal lobe called the premotor pre cortex and supplementary motor areas. And th but that, that strip M1, it's really important for controlling your own body. Now, one thing that's not pictured here, one thing that's not in these pictures so far, but worth mentioning is the thalamus, which is an area that's tucked in the middle of the brain. It's a big clump of neurons on each side, not far from the limbic system structures we mentioned earlier. Most sensory information passes through the thalamus, like sight, sound, touch, taste, balance, just about everything except smell is the only exception. So basically before things get to these primary receiving areas for the various senses, we'll be seeing that the thalamus is pretty much always the last stop right before it goes to those places in the cortex, in the cerebral cortex, the outer layer. Okay, now I mentioned before that each lobe in our brain has a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere, like a right half and a left half, right? And we saw that in those rotating skull pictures, we, we kind of saw that highlighting one of the lobes. You can see there would have been the other lobe on the other side. Most of the brain's sensory and motor wiring is laid out contralaterally. So for basically everything except smell, and we'll come back to that, but for all our other senses and for our motor wiring, the brain is laid out with this basic opposite side wiring. That means the right hemisphere of each lobe controls and processes information from the left half of the body, and the left hemisphere of each lobe controls and processes information from the right half of the body. So contra for opposite, and then lateral for side, again, like a lateral football pass. Contra lateral just means opposite side processing. So for example, with vision, this picture here would be looking at someone's brain from above. The eyes are on the right side of the picture here, the left eye and the right eye, okay? And the visual field, the, the world in front of them that they can see is in, highlighted in purple and orange. What you'll notice is the wiring from our eyes is set up so that things in our left visual field, often the left periphery, shown here in purple, end up getting processed in the right part of our brain, in the right side of V1, there at the back of the occipital lobe in the back of our brain. Stuff in the right visual field, often our right periphery in orange here, ends up in the left half of our brain, the left half when it gets back to the occipital lobe and hits V1. Likewise, for touch. If someone touches the the left half of your body, right? Like the left half of the baby in this picture here, shaded in purple, Notice that the wires go up to the right half of the baby's brain. So we show the right half of the baby's brain kind of in purple at the top there in the little cortex outer layer. 
And specifically, we know it goes to the parietal lobe because that's where touch is initially processed. So touches to the left half of your body go to the right parietal lobe, the right somatosensory cortex, that little strip, okay? And touches to the right half of your body go to the left par parietal lobe. And likewise, same, same kind of wiring for motor signals that you send out from your brain, that you send out from the primary motor cortex there in the frontal lobe. As those wires go out, your right hemisphere is controlling your left arm and left leg and all that, while your left hemisphere is controlling your right arm and right leg and so on. Thankfully, the two halves of your brain are not permanently cut off from each other. They do communicate. Signals go across what's called the corpus callosum. That's, the, that's how they communicate. They do, they do communicate. We can see the corpus callosum in the left picture here. It's the area highlighted in red. It ensures that information from both sides gets integrated together. So the corpus callosum is really important for communicating across those two hemispheres, the two halves of each of those lobes. Now, I just want to briefly address here a common misconception kind of in passing. You might have heard people describe themselves or others as being a left-brained person or a right-brained person, usually in terms of whether they're, you know, creative or logical or something like that. This is an understandable confusion, but it's wrong. It's a big misconception about how the brain works. Neuroscientists have never said that some people are left-brained or right-brained. In fact, an August 2013 study, they actually went and analyzed brain scans of over 1,000 people. So this is a very large sample for brain scan studies because they're super expensive, cost hundreds of dollars for an hour in the scanner. They, they had this huge sample size, analyzed all these brain scans, and found that everyone used both sides pretty much equally. Now, the, the, where the misunderstanding comes from, the misunderstanding likely arose from the, oops, sorry, from the, the very real fact that some functions, not some people, but some functions, some tasks that we do are processed heavier on one side of the brain. So just for example, as we'll see throughout this course, language is processed in a network that's more in the left hemisphere. So a little bit of activity in the right hemisphere, but language is mostly processed, primarily processed in the left hemisphere. So when you're doing language tasks, that's the side of the brain we see light up, but that's the case for all of us, for all brains. And on the other hand, on the right hemisphere, a lot of things like a lot of spatial information processing, things like say uh, faces are processed more in the right hemisphere. But even for those activities, the hemispheres communicate very heavily due to that corpus callosum, thankfully, and the important thing is that all of us use both of those hemispheres in the same way. We're not left-brained or, le or right-brained people. That's a myth. Now, I want to touch on an interesting phenomenon that, that you can actually experience at home if you want to try this out, if you're interested. Let's start with a couple of facts that we've learned so far. Fact one, neurons are constantly firing at a low baseline rate. Right? When we say a neuron fired or was activated, what we usually mean is it went above its baseline rate, but we know there are kind of just constantly some background, beep, 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 just occasional firing. Okay. Fact number two, the brain is a pattern finding machine. It's, it, it finds, it constructs, it makes perceptions that are kind of just its best guess about how the world out there is based on the input it happens to have from the neurons that it, that it has right? The neurons that are firing there, it looks for patterns and from that constructs our perceptions of the world, what we actually experience, what we see and hear. The conclusion from that is, if we were to shut off sensory input, stop giving sensory input to the brain, for example, as you start to go blind, then maybe your eyes aren't sending as many signals to your brain or even just putting on a blindfold for a long time, something like that. If you do that, the brain will continue trying to make sense of things. They'll continue looking for patterns. It will actually try to construct perceptions out of whatever it's got. In this case, if it's not getting signals like it normally does, then it might try to make perceptions out of that random baseline firing, the neural noise that's always just there in the background. So if you want to experience this for yourself, you can actually induce some simple hallucinations without any fun drugs at all using something called a Gansfeld procedure. Uh, a simple at-home version of this would be to just cut a ping pong ball in half and put it over your eyes with the idea being that you want to get a uniform visual field. 
So it works best actually if you put something like a, a little red light, like a little red LED up against each one. But even with just a uniform white field from like a, a room light or a lamp being on will work just fine. You may have to cut two ping pong balls if they have like branding on them or something because you want it to just be a uniform white field so that even with your eyes open looking into these ping pong balls, all you're going to be getting is the same boring, static, unchanging uh, input to your eyes. You might also want to, to make this work the best, you may also want to put on some white noise on with like headphones or earbuds. You can find white noise on YouTube pretty easily uh, and just play that or download MP3s of it from the internet. Pretty easy to find. Then what you do, you just lay there for a few minutes and try not to move around much. You can obviously blink, you can breathe and everything, but you want to basically make it so that your visual field, right, your visual and, and if you're doing white noise and also your auditory sensory systems, they're going to get bored because they're just getting static. They're getting static, unchanging input, which is largely the same to the brain as getting no input at all to your brain that total lack of interesting change is like not getting info at all. But you're still gonna have spontaneous baseline firing of all the neurons there in the visual part of your brain. But now the input starved brain is gonna amplify those spontaneous random firings, kind of like turning up the gain on something. And your brain, the pattern recognizing machine that it is, will try to make sense of that random firing in the visual cortex, which leads to experiencing hallucinations. And a hallucination just means having a perception of something that's not there, right? So sort of having a perception in this case without real sensation or without changing sensation, perception of something not out there in the world. It's pretty fun, it's easy to do, it's totally safe. I've had students tell me it usually starts as some weird little patterns that they hallucinate, but if you sit there long enough after a few more minutes, it may start to look like more complicated objects or even scenes. Now, if you Google Gansfeld, you might also run into some stuff where people have tried to use it in some really poorly designed tests to see if humans have psychic powers. And just FYI, those attempts have had really gaping methodological flaws. Any careful studies that have been done over and over have found null results, no evidence at all for psychic phenomena with this Gansfeld-like procedure. It has nothing to do with psychic experiences. Again, it's just an epiphenomenon of a brain that's built from making sense and recognizing patterns in our visual cortex when we, in this case, put it in an unusual situation of no input. At any rate, that's enough of an overview to get us into some cognitive neuroscience topics in the following videos where we will see what happens to someone if, say, their corpus callosum is damaged and the left half of their brain can't talk to the right half, and we'll explore a little further into things like how brain imaging works.